is it is it felt by many around golf people that really know that Tiger Woods has used roids in the past or may have used roids in the past? Is that kind of the general feeling? Yes, that is it. It, it is, except for the people in Tiger's corner. <laughs> I mean, you better shut up about it. Uh, nobody has ever um, gone out like that. Nobody's ever really said that like I'm saying it right now but I just there's just no doubt um and I would say it about 80 or 90 percent of the people out there know that you know something ain't right okay but uh look let's let's get to some of the other good stuff that happened this week I yeah. mean wh yeah. what were your feelings on the Masters overall I'm just curious well, I want to know. I want to know your feelings. I like the fact. I'll tell you mine. My feelings are that the Masters uh, toughened up, and the Masters and Scotty Scheffler might be the mental, most mentally tough athlete in the United States right now. Well, uh, you got that right. Uh, uh, that golf course was as hard as I've ever seen it, and I think it was over the edge on, uh, you know, definitely on Saturday, but. It seemed like, you know, Scotty made chumps out of everybody. I mean, he won by four shots. And it seemed like everybody, you know, out there, when they got a shot at it, they'd make a double bogey. I mean, Max Homa making a double. Uh, Colin Morikawa, I mean, it was a four-way tie, you know, with, uh, you know, nine, ten holes to go. And Scotty wins by four. He put on the afterburners yesterday and showed us, you know, what he's made of. And it seemed like every time... Dan, that that uh, he was stressed like yesterday after he made excuse me, like on Saturday after he made a double bogey on the 10th hole, he put it on the afterburners and made four birdies coming in. You know, every time it seemed like he was challenged, uh, he made a couple bogeys yesterday early. Then he rattles off three birdies in a row and then he rattles off three birdies the next four holes uh, later on in the round. So this is destined. Uh, you know, he was destined to win this thing. And I don't know if, you know, you can say that Auberg is, you know, a distant second at, at seven under. I mean, he was in it. He made a double bogey going in, going into the 11th hole, made a double when this tournament was up for grabs. But that just shows the, the, the way that Augusta National was playing, where if you didn't hit a good shot or if you hit a marginal shot, it wasn't just costing you one shot. It was costing you a couple. And uh, I just saw that up and down the leaderboard, man, guys were, you know, making five and six footer for bogeys sometimes. And I think the golf course kind of got away from it. it. Looked like, you know, they couldn't stop the ball near the hole. They were, you know, from six feet, they were knocking it five feet by and having to make comebackers for, for a two putt from six feet. So I thought it was maybe one of the toughest masters I've ever witnessed. And I've been going there since about 1984. That's enough time to get a good sense of it. Somebody, a friend of mine told me who has played on a variety of tours and was there Thursday, said the 11th hole at Augusta National this week's the hardest par four he's ever seen. Well, it's one of them, but it always is the hardest uh, hole because yeah. it uh, used to be kind of wide open on the right side, but they planted a bunch of trees over there. Uh, you might remember the time that Tiger won. He hit it right of the trees and had a great little alley. That was back in 2019, I think. Uh, but it's 525 yards. It is a little bit downhill, not a whole lot. Um, but it, you have to just pierce it off the tee, and you have to keep it away from that lake on the left-hand side on your approach. And that lake is just intrusive into the into the front of the green. And that's what Auburn did uh, uh, the young kid from Sweden, he's a hell of a player, but he knocked it in the water. Now he'll have to fight those spooks for the rest of his life. Hey, remember when I did that, my rookie year? <laughs> we'll see how he deals with that. That's what happens, right? That that That's why I say Scheffler is like the toughest dude ever. He comes off missing a five-footer at Houston that would have sent it into a playoff, and all he's done since then is win. He just don't give a shit when it's over. When like He just... He, he he just has a mental tough. Let me ask you this: who who overperformed in your mind, and who underperformed in your mind? Well, I think the guy that overperformed is Tommy Fleetwood, and um, I think Max Homa. You would say that too. I mean, Max Homa has always been a pretty good player, but he's uh, you know they've a lot of people have said you know he's one of the best five in the in the in the world, and I'm I'm thinking where do they get that? You know, a lot of people on the Max Homa train, maybe if they went to 
UC Berkeley or something. Uh, so I, I think Max Homa overperformed, even though he went really dry. I went in rounds two and three with making birdies. He was he was hitting the ball just about as good, if not better, than anybody. Um, you know, Tommy Fleetwood had what we call a backdoor top five. You know, he shot a really good score yesterday. Why he hasn't won on the PGA Tour is a mystery to me, but he hasn't yet. So I would say a third place finish for him. Um, that's pretty good for Tommy Fleetwood. Maybe he can build on that. But Colin Morikawa, you know, people think that he's an overachiever too, but I, yeah, he is. Um, but he's a guy that should be on that leaderboard. And again, if he had made two double bogeys yesterday, one on nine and one on 11, you know, he might have been uh, a little bit closer to the head man, Scotty Scheffler. I coached college basketball for a long time, and I used to call guys that were really talented but didn't get a win for you good enough to get you fired. I'm watching Max Homa. Is Max Homa like an uber-talented guy that eventually will break through uh, in majors? You know, yeah, at the right major, I think he could. Um, He's challenged with his distance a little bit. You know, uh, he's not the super long like Auberg and uh, and Scotty Scheffler and some of the some of the, you know John Rom and players of that ilk, um, but he can get it done on uh, on on a certain type of golf course. He was kind of lucky that uh, Augusta played a lot shorter than it has in the past. It's it was a lot drier and firmer, so his lack of distance compared to the big boys wasn't as pronounced. So. I, I really have a lot of faith in Max Homa. I, I honestly do. He's won the LA Open. He's won a couple of other really good tournaments. Usually if a guy's got the stones to win the LA Open, I mean, he's pretty strong. That's a great test of golf at Riviera. So, you know, maybe this is the first of things to come for, for Max Homa because he hasn't done well in majors in the past. I think he's only got one top 10 in his whole life. Where are you at, Mark, with Liv preparing you or not preparing you for tournaments like that? You know, this week it doesn't look like the Liv guys did as well. I think there were two or three in the top 10, maybe four in the top 12, something like that. But I I think they got it right. Uh, I think playing the week before, is uh, it gets you ready, especially if you're only playing uh, 14 times a year. If you have one of those tournaments before a major, an LIV tournament before a major, I I think that's a good idea. Um, you know, and I think one year, maybe two years ago, I think we had, you know, three out of the top four were LIV players. So it's just a matter of who's on form and when. Uh, I got to admit, I was surprised at Rom not playing well this week, but it was a, a beast of a golf course. And uh, we did have, you know, there were a couple of guys that did play well uh, uh, from Liv, uh, you know, Bryson DeChambeau and Cameron Smith and Patrick Reed. Those guys are always going to be going to man up for a major championship. They're just major championship type players. So, uh, yeah, I don't I think this year was kind of an anomaly that nobody was in the top five uh, on the LIV tour. Maybe there was a guy in the top six, but. Anyway, it it's just works out that way sometimes. Uh, there were only 13 LIV players there this week out of 89, field of 89. Where are you at with that? Are they ever going to come together? What, what do you see five years from now? What do you see happening between the two tours? They, there has to be some sort of a peace-giving moment, I think. And I think the tour played it absolutely incorrectly by stonewalling with the powers that be on the LIV and because they stonewalled, they paid, um, you know, they've got the big bank account at LIV. So they lost some of their great players because here's what I think. And and look, I'm still a member of the PGA tour ever since 1977. I played 18 years out there, played two years internationally and I love the tour, but I understand some of the players, the worldwide players going other places. I honestly do. You know, uh, golf is mainly played in America, I would say, for the the basic fan, but it doesn't live here. I mean, it's it just doesn't live here. I mean, they play in South Africa, Australia, the eastern seaboard, you know, the, the Asian coast. I mean, everywhere they play, 
And I think that LIV is a good option for a lot of players. I honestly do. Pam Smith, when he left, and John Rom, I don't blame those guys. Um, you know, it's hundreds of millions of dollars. It's life-changing. And they can still play in majors. But I think that the majors are unfair in, in blocking more LIV players, like Taylor Gooch. Taylor Gooch, everybody knows, is a great player. And for them to keep him out of the U.S. Open last year was absurd. They made a special rule to keep him out. Uh, they're making it tougher and tougher for LIV guys to get in there. I mean, Dustin Johnson's going to be able to play in the Masters every year. So will Patrick Reed. So will John Rom. They're going to be LIV players, right? But because they won the Masters, they'll get in every year. And uh, outside of that, uh, it's hard for them to get points to stay up on the top of you know, the world golf rankings because they're not giving them ranking points at LIV and they're not, not letting them play in any other tournaments except for the Asian tour. So uh, it's going to be pretty tough for these guys to get way up on the world, world golf rankings. Mark, last thing, I want to go back to Scotty Scheffler. Um, how good is he historically or is it yet to be seen? Boy, it's pretty good what he's doing so far, don't you think? I mean, if if he if he keeps this up, I mean, this is crazy uh, what he's doing. This this is Tiger kind of stuff, and um, you know, we're looking at a guy get it done a different way. You know, his feet are all over the place. He he doesn't he he hardly ever turns the ball right to left. He got this kind of hang on fade out there, but he's so strong and powerful that he can beat that fade. You know, the fade is kind of like not a distant shot, but he carries it so damn far, and he's so big and strong. Man, it's a quite a lethal combination that he's got. Now, he did have a little bit of a, a spell with his putting, I want to say, for about a year. But, you know, it's hard to stay a great putter uh, for forever. I mean, you're going to have your off years and your off weeks or your off months, but sometimes it helps. Sometimes you say, okay, I think now I understand my stroke a little bit better. Uh, obviously he's gotten it together cause he looked pretty solid to me, uh, the last four out of five weeks. Uh, so yeah. I think, you know, the best is yet to come for him and that's kind of scary, isn't it, Dan? The Masters is something that I watch Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. No, I don't sit down and watch the entire thing. I do, however, watch a lot of it. And the other day, it was Saturday, I happened to play golf with my wife, do a bunch of stuff. Or maybe it was before I played golf with my wife and did a bunch of stuff. I can't remember. But I was sitting down and I was watching Tiger Woods because on ESPN Plus, they have featured pairings. Woods was one of the pairings. And I'm watching him, and I don't know. Gets a birdie. Wow, what's going to happen here? Next thing you know, like double, then a bogey, then another double, then another bogey. And the man looked cooked. So the guy broadcasting is a man named Billy Kratzer, who I know. He's from Indiana. So I text Billy. I go, Billy, get Tiger Woods' ass off my screen. And he laughs because he knows I'm kidding because I like Tiger, else I wouldn't be watching. But he did say, boy, oh boy, is he dealing with a lot physically. And this goes back to what I said last Friday. I'm watching Tiger Woods on Thursday, and he looked miserable. I don't mean a little miserable. I mean miserable. Now, he looked jacked. He looked ripped. The upper body looked like something out of a fitness magazine. A 48-year-old man is not supposed to look like that. His last name is Dockage, and I did, well, did not look like that. But Tiger Woods shot himself a sassy little plus 16. Tiger Woods dropped a 77 on Sunday, which actually was five strokes better than what he had done on Saturday. See, here's the deal. Isaiah Thomas, not the little Isaiah Thomas, the good Isaiah Thomas, he famously said one time, be nice to the people on your way up because those are the same people you're going to see on your way down. Well, I guarantee you, back in the day, when Tiger Woods was wearing red on Sunday and crushing souls and winning fans and women were weeping and men were puffing their chests and fists bumping because Tiger just knocked in a birdie on 16 and Vern said he had never seen anything like it, 
I guarantee you Tiger Woods looked at the Sandy Lyles, the Ben Crenshaws, the Freddie Couples of the world and snorted. I don't know if that's a snort or a sniff, but it doesn't matter. What the hell are those guys still doing out here? I would never do that. Why are they playing, Larry Mize? Why are you out here? That's not right. You're taking up someone's spot. I can see that. I can see most players. Hell, I could see me doing that back in the day. When you're young and dumb and full of never mind, then you have a tendency to think you're invincible. But I'll tell you this, young fucks. Young bucks, I said. Not the other word. Young bucks. I get a little tongue-tied. Life comes at you fast. My mother famously said life's a dream, and all of a sudden you wake up and you're 60. Well, she actually said 50, but now I'm 60, and it's the same thing. You wake up and you go, son of a biscuit maker, where in the hell did this go? You look around, you go, huh, it wasn't 10 to 15 minutes ago that I was just throwing acorns at cars and and it happened to be an FBI agent who stopped, pulled into my driveway, went up to my dad, and I had a serious problem. Fast forward. Now, wait. Huh? I got a fake hip, a fake knee. Anyway, enough about me. I digress to Tiger. I guarantee you he was one of those guys. I guarantee you that in his mind he thought, I would never do that. Well, guess what? That's where you're at at 48. And, you know, I believe this. I believe if not for that last accident, the one where he mangled his leg, and Ryan Burr's going to talk about that because he's in he's in Tiger Woods' inner circle, I believe were it not for that mangled leg, Tiger would probably be competing, at least in the Masters. I believe he would be competing in most things. You know, it doesn't seem to be a back. The knee seems to be fine. Hell, if the knee's no good, go get your replacement and go play. I, mean, I just played 36 holes in about 24 hours this weekend, yesterday and the day before, and did it actually 36 holes and then played 36 the next day on a fake knee. Go get your fake knee and play. But that last accident cooked him. As one of the great Knicks said, Tiger Woods is cooked. He is cooked. He is done. And before he won the last Masters, I was not one of those that said he should hang it up. I personally didn't care who he was having sex with. It didn't matter to me that he was stripping a Perkins lady or every little hostess at every little casino. It didn't bother me that his wife put a nine iron through. It didn't bother me that Tiger Woods got a DUI for prescription drugs. None of that bothered me. What do I care? That's him. That ain't me. I'm not judgmental on that. I just want him to play golf. All that stuff could have ha- could have not had the dramatic effect of cooking Tiger Woods' career had it not been for the accident. There are a lot of questions about the accident that are never going to be answered. You know, a lot of people say, all gas, no brakes. That's what it seems to have been in that accident, allegedly. Hell, I don't know. But you wonder what was in his mindset when he had that accident. He seems like a happy man off the court pr- or the pitch or whatever the hell it's called, the course, especially, especially when he's with his son, Charlie. Charlie was his swing swing coach yesterday, and it didn't work out very good. So long story short, I'm a big fan of Tiger Woods. I watch Tiger Woods even when he's cooked. I love the fact that he wore the red on Sunday. I love the fact that after making the cut and he was one over, he looked at the leaders who were seven over and said, you know, I'm only eight back. And I got to tell you, for a split second, I believed him. I did. I actually did believe him. I actually thought, you know what? He is only eight back. If he can get this to four, maybe he's in business. But man, oh man, it wasn't going to happen. Now, somebody's going to say to me, well, you know, it's really hilly there. I get that. Makes it hard to walk. I get that. Makes it impossible. I get that. I get all of it. But the truth of the matter is, you tell me, is there any course more built for Tiger Woods? Is there any course that Tiger Woods can play better than Augusta National? Knows more than Augusta National? There isn't. Period. And for him to shoot what he shot, I think he's cooked. That leg ain't getting better. Ryan has told me, Ryan Burr, who's coming on the show, has told me it is unbelievably mangled. And when you see him in shorts, it's sad, if nothing else. It's very, very sad. Very sad. So at the end of the day, you know what? At the end of the day, Tiger Woods is going to have to figure it out if he wants to be the grand dame, if he wants to be the guy that shows up at events, does he want to be the guy that just kind of sort of starts the event, hosts the event, maybe built the course that the event is on, or does he want to keep playing? If he wants to keep playing, he's got a long way to go. That's all I'm going to say. Got a long way to go. Because I'm not one of those. 
Like, I'm not one of those that hates seeing older players not play well. I'm not. Like, everybody points to Willie Mays in center field. Yeah, I didn't care about Willie Mays. I didn't know Willie Mays. I didn't. I didn't know Willie Mays. I was too young. I heard he was great. I saw the catch. I, I've seen the numbers. He's great. But I didn't know him when he played with the Mets back in the day. I'm a Cup fan. The Mets weren't on TV. We didn't have all these TVs. So I'm not one of those. If Tiger Woods laces him up and goes out and plays, I'll watch. But I know this. He ain't winning. I know this. He ain't going to be on the leaderboard on Sunday. That I know. And that got confirmed to me. That very much got confirmed to me this weekend. And I'm not happy about it. But I do say this. You young guys, life comes at you fast. Very fast. My master's reaction, let me give it to you. Scotty Scheffler may be the nicest, best dude ever. Like, I'm watching Scotty Scheffler, and I'm thinking, what a dude. Now, here's the other part of it to me. Scotty Scheffler may be the toughest dude ever. Scotty Scheffler, well, not ever, current. Tiger Woods was as tough as they come. You get what I'm saying here. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the pressure guys are under walking down a fairway in the lead for 18 holes? You got to maintain it. You lose the lead. Four people are tied at six. What do you do? Ah, you go get three straight birdies. Look, that's toughness. That is real toughness. Real toughness isn't walking up to somebody and punching them in the head. Real toughness isn't sitting behind a camera and criticizing somebody or sitting behind a typewriter and writing a hate article. That's not real toughness. That's just a job. Or sometimes that's just cowardice. Real toughness is for four hours, every shot, can't miss one, with the expectations of the world on you. I'll go back to Tiger Woods. See, Tiger Woods was the toughest athlete there is. Why is Tiger Woods the toughest athlete there is? Because every time he played, everybody expected him to win. Period. Period. Now, at the end of the day, here's the deal. Tiger Woods did. Tiger Woods delivered. Tiger Woods said, hey, Here's where we're headed. We're headed to victory lane. We're headed to a championship. And everybody was trying to be Tiger Woods. So everybody started lifting weights. Everybody got big and strong. Everybody started getting, it, get, started getting down. It was unbelievable. It was incredible. And he delivered. Well, fast forward. Now we're in Scotty Scheffler world. Scotty Scheffler world is the same world. Scotty Scheffler world is, hey, look, here's the deal. Scotty Scheffler's supposed to win. It's Scotty Scheffler against the field. Scotty Scheffler is the best player, highest odds since Tiger Woods. Huh. Whoa. And guess what? He delivered. Now, I got to tell you, that's toughness. That's not kind of, sort of, maybe toughness. That's not kind of, well, you know what? He ain't that tough because he's not getting tackled or he's not going to the rim or he's not. No, 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 no. This is the kind of toughness that makes men wilt. That's the kind of toughness that makes great players, excuse me, that separates great players from really good players. I mean, let's be honest. All these guys out there are great. I had a friend yesterday, we played golf, and he's talking about, wow, look at how Morikawa does this or that. And I'm like, hold on. It led me to a story about Fuzzy Zeller. Fuzzy Zeller's hitting balls in a practice round. He's, he's doing a clinic before a round at the Indiana Basketball Scholarship Golf Outing. And some lady, there's stands, little temporary stands, and he's hitting like three irons, and he's hitting missiles, right? And some lady's going, oh, my God, look at that. Oh, my God. And guess what? Fuzzy Zeller looks at her and says, lady, I'm the U.S. Open champ. What do you expect, ground balls? No, we don't expect ground balls. But when the expectations are so high and we deliver, the one thing I don't want to do, I don't want to do, is just say, well, he's supposed to do that. No, 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 no. You got to celebrate it a little bit. These are the best in the world coming at this man. Just like they did for Tiger. Just like they did for Serena Williams. Just like they did for Sampras back in the day. And he stood up in Augusta 
And boom. Boom. Man. Mm. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Uh, I like it. I like it a lot. It's fantastic. And you know what? It's got to be celebrated. Too often, we don't celebrate. Too often, we don't say, hey, look, that's greatness. And we got to watch it. Three birdies in a row when it's tied. Think about that. Here they come. Everybody's coming. <laughs> that's pretty good. No, it's really good. Uh, <laughs> man, at some point you got to celebrate it, don't you? At some point you got to say this is great because it goes fast. Let me put them together. Here's how fast it goes. Did you see Tiger? It seems like 10 minutes ago we were watching Tiger win the U.S. Amateur. It seems like 10 minutes ago that's what we were doing. That's what we were doing. 10 minutes ago. Now he's what? 16 over. It goes fast, so it's got to be celebrated. I, I remember saying to people, I will watch Tiger Woods because he's tougher than any athlete that there is. <laughs> I, seriously, he's tougher than any athlete. Well, I got to tell you, Scotty Scheffler is right there with him because when you go and you got to win and you're battling and it's tied and you're reeling and you reel off six straight or three straight birdies, that's toughness. That's real toughness. Other masters reaction. How cool was it for the Shipley kid to be able to play golf with Tiger Woods? He's a kid in grad school on Ohio State's golf team. Now, if I was Shipley and I looked at Tiger Woods, this is what I would do. All right. I would say, hey, here's the deal. I got to get a haircut. I got to get in shape. That's what I would do. I'd be like, all right, this is pretty cool when I'm out there with my buddies. You know, I'm kind of the fat kid that plays golf. But, whoa, wait a second. Look at this guy. This is the best to ever do it. I got to do what he does. I mean, and by all accounts, I mean, not by all accounts, I saw it. Tiger Woods is ripped. Tiger Woods is absolutely ripped and perfect. I mean, Tiger Woods has always dressed perfectly. Like I always said that about my wife, Lee, Urban Meyer, Tiger Woods. They're always impeccably dressed. The shoes match the shirt, matches everything else. I mean, seriously, you know what I, you know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> it's unbelievable. Uh <laughs> I mean, I get a kick out of it. It's awesome. My other's master's reaction. Max Home ain't ready. Max Home is a nice guy. Max Home has won big tournaments, but he wasn't ready for that yesterday. But you know what? Max Home is going to be ready. I think yesterday, Max Homa did something that is awesome. I think yesterday, Max Homa played lost and sometimes playing and losing. And getting passed by that Auberg guy, I think that's awesome. Because that teaches you where you got to be. And you stand in that fire. Now, he's not Scotty Scheffler, but he may have Scotty Scheffler talent. Uh, that Auberg kid looked really good. But I'm anxious to see what happens with Max Homa. Because right now, he doesn't quite have that. But he does. And he's going to be very, very good. And he's going to win. I wouldn't be surprised if Max Homa doesn't win one of the majors this year. I wouldn't be surprised at all. So there you go. A couple of other things on the Masters. Say whatever you want. Do whatever you want. But I got to tell you, I love that the Masters made the course harder. I love that Augusta National made it more difficult. I love that it's longer. I love, love that, you know what? They don't shoot 20 under, 15 under. Yeah, DeChambeau got off to a crazy ride. But man, oh man, that 11th hole, I had a friend tell me that that plays championship level golf. He was there on Thursday. He said, that's the hardest go uh, par four I've ever seen in my life. He goes, you don't even know. Everything goes to the water. And you saw what happened on Sunday. Guys are hitting it in the water. He goes, that is the hardest par four I've ever seen in my life. And if you hit the green in two, if you keep it on the green in two, you're doing great. Great. 
So that was a lot of fun to watch. What a week, right? What a couple weeks. We got the NCAA tournament, and now we've got the Masters. Now we move into, well, we move into the NBA playoffs. O.J. Simpson, this is smart. You can say whatever you'd like, but this is smart. O.J. Simpson made everybody, including doctors, sign non-disclosure agreements on his deathbed in hospice. That's smart. Now it is. It protects everybody. See, think about this. You're O.J. Simpson's kid, kids, grandkids, whatever, doctors. What's everybody want to know? Did he confess on his deathbed? That's what everybody wants to know. Hey, man, the Jews confess. Hey, man, the Jews let you know that, you know, maybe he did it. Was it the Gambino crime family? What did he say? What did he say? Well, this protects everybody because now the world knows that, you know what? I can't talk. I can't talk. You know, I have got a, well, I have got a non-disclosure. That's right. I got a non-disclosure. And that non-disclosure, I, I can't break it. I'm not paying a sh- ton of money. No. So everybody now knows. So they will not be hounded. See, many people think the non-disclosure is so nobody will tell. See, in my world, that's pretty smart. O.J. Simpson and his attorneys had to know that once O.J. Simpson passed away, nobody knew who he was. Or, excuse me. Everybody was going to ask, did he do it? Did he do it? Did he tell you he did it? And O.J. and his lawyers protected everybody. I got an NDA, man. Well, did he tell you? I got an NDA. What's wrong? And then people go away. Smart. Very smart. I like Jeremy Shamp's argument. Hey, look, here's the deal. If you look at the evidence, you come to the conclusion that O.J. Simpson did it. And I have. I've read three or four different books, including Jeffrey Tubin's book, which was really good on it. And if you're going to believe these books and you're going to believe what's going on, even that the cops were corrupt and all that other stuff that was going on in L.A. at that time, you simply come to the conclusion that O.J. did it. You just do. Um, How about this? Caitlin Clark. Let's talk Caitlin Clark. So Caitlin Clark is coming here. And let me tell you the biggest impact that Caitlin Clark has had on Indiana. Want to know? In the great state of Indiana, Dockage is king. Dockage's show is rising. We started a new one on a new network, and it's rising. Here's what Caitlin Clark's impact is. Lynn Dunn, who's one of my favorite people to talk to, is the general manager, vice president of the Fever, not the Pacers, the Fever. She's starting today, coming on with me weekly. Now, with all due respect to Lynn Dunn and everybody else, I'm not even sure my last year when they were really bad, I even mentioned the fever. And I'm being serious here. Like, think about summers in Indy. We don't have professional baseball. So you got to mention something. The fever way back, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, had won a WNB title. I didn't even mention them. And I'm being a little bit facetious here, right? I am. But here's the bigger issue. 36 of 40 games are going to be on national TV. Last year, Fever Uno. Bigger venues. I want you to think about this for just a second. Bigger venues. Bigger venues. Now think about this. We're moving to bigger venues. In Iowa, in Iowa City alone, listen to this. The women's basketball team, a.k.a. Caitlin Clark, added $82.5 million to the local economy, 82.5, 82. How about that? Now, with all due respect to every other women, woman out there, women's basketball team, women's basketball program, ain't nobody got the impact to her. And see, downtown Indy right now is a dump. We allowed because we have a ridiculous mayor who didn't show the night of the riots a few years ago. We've never recovered. I mean, hell, we just had a 12-year-old shoot up the mall, which is right downtown, shooting a bunch of other 17-year-olds. We got a prosecutor, which is how I'm going to get out of jury duty, by the way. Uh, We have a prosecutor that says, well, you're okay. No bail. Let's go. It's corrupt as hell. Shootings every night, people taking dumps in the street, all kind of craziness, and it hasn't come back. We need a savior. 
I would have thought the savior would be Anthony Richardson. I mean, when football's good, downtown is pumping, yo. But that savior, I believe, is going to be none other than Caitlin Clark. Caitlin Clark is going to come in here, and she's going to be the biggest star. I don't know if y'all saw this, but she completely knocked it out on Saturday Night Live. She did. Now, that makes her an even bigger star. You could argue right now in the world of women's sports, the biggest star is Caitlin Clark, because I would say who's number two? I mean, we really don't have a Serena Williams in tennis anymore. We don't have a Tiger – oh, well, Tiger Woods a man. We really don't have a professional women's golfer. We don't really have anybody else in the WNBA. I mean, Angel Reese will have a little bit of a niche. Certainly, Juju Watkins will have a niche. But nobody's got the cachet nationwide that Caitlin Clark has, and she's coming to India. I'll tell you what Lynn Dunn told me. I had her on the air a week or so ago. I said, okay, who you drafted? She can't say who you're drafting, but what she did say was, hey, Dan, and she's got the greatest voice ever, hey, Dan, let me put it to you this way. Season tickets are selling out, and most of them are from Iowa area codes. See, Iowa isn't that stupid far from Indy. When I would drive from Indy to Iowa City, it's about five hours. Now, you got to go through Indiana. You got to go through Iowa. You got to get into, you got to get into, Iowa, and then there you go. It's all highway. It's an easy drive. If you live in Illinois, which is closer, obviously, and, well, you like Caitlin Clark, it's an easy drive. People in the great city of Indianapolis will come out to the games. Now, here's the deal. Yes, Indiana is a basketball state. Yes, we pride ourselves on loving hoops, but no. The Pacers last year or two years ago, I can't remember which one, were last in the NBA in attendance. See, we'll watch hoops, but it's got to be good hoops. It's got to be legit hoops. We're not great for, like, the Big Ten versus ACC All-Star game. We haven't been great for the Fever except for the year that they won. But Caitlin Clark's first game here at Gamebridge Fieldhouse, which, by the way, she already has a sponsorship for. She is a representative or sponsored by, however you want to put it, of Gamebridge. So that's already happening. So if you think the fever of drafting anybody else, you must be crazy. Long story short, Caitlin Clark's opening game here is going to be like Nicholson and Diane Cannon and MJ, Michael Jackson, and the rest showing up at Showtime in L.A. Now, I invite them if they want to go fishing out here on my lake. I'll invite the biggest stars in Hollywood to come out. Hell, I'll let them Airbnb my house, but they're going to have to pay through the schnoz. But that's what it's going to be here. It's going to be the biggest show in the country when Caitlin Clark opens it up. And here's what's also happening in the WNBA. The WNBA are moving games. Now think about this. The WNBA are moving games to accommodate Caitlin Clark. Now what do you think is going to happen? What do you think is going to happen? I think that what's going to happen is because, because uh, Lynn Dunn and all are very smart, very, very smart. I think Caitlin Clark is going to have a damn team around her full of people that she likes, people that are good enough, but she's going to have a group around her that isn't going to be the pains in the ass, the lesbian thing that causes problems or gets jealous or the racial thing. She's not going to have any of that. She's not. What she is going to have is a team built around her, period. That's what she's going to have because Lynn Dunn is smart. The Pacers organization are smart. They are. The home opener taking place against the Liberty, and this is already sold out. The cheapest ticket is 70 bucks, and that's up in the nosebleed. Let me, un- let me give you this. Let me give you this. Normally, you could walk down the street and get a ticket for a fever game by going, hey, you got a ticket for the fever game? Yeah, here you go. You want two? Yeah. Not anymore. Not anymore. Uh, Las, the Las Vegas Aces announced they're upgrading their home opener against Clark in the Fever to the T-Mobile Arena because it allows 7,000 more seats. How about that? That's pretty good. 
7,000 more seats in an arena in Vegas. She plays in Vegas. She plays nationally. And away you go. Mm. How about that? That's pretty good. No, that's really good. So, congratulations to us. We have a savior. Now, if Anthony Richardson could stay healthy and throw the ball to the right team, our toes would really be tapping. But we'll see. What else we got here today? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I got the AD at Texas mad at me right now because I said, I guess erroneously, but I was told this, that a kid just went there for 600000 I think the AD is a guy named Ogden. I could be wrong. I, I could be. All right? Eh. He says my credibility is at stake. Yeah? Credibility this, Ogden. I deleted the tweet because maybe it is wrong, but I was told by a pretty good source 600K was the number. That must be wrong because the AD, I think he's the AD. If he's not the AD, I don't want some, I don't want, I, I don't want some damn, uh, uh, oh, he's the general manager of the basketball team <laughs> at Texas. <laughs> oh, man, that's pretty funny. That is really, really funny. Oh, boy. Anyway, there you go. Uh, college football. College football back in the news. And here's the deal with college football. College football, you got to be bitching. We got to be complaining. And guess who's doing some complaining? Well, it's Brian Kelly. Brian Kelly has to be doing some complaining. And Brian Kelly is, well... Here's his, here's his thing. He wants a salary cap. <clears throat> well, if we had a salary cap, I'd be okay with it. But there's no salary cap. I mean, that's the issue, really. I mean, if we were all operated under the same guidelines, at least we could, you know, know, okay, this is what we got. But that's really the biggest issue. Oh, he's right as hell. He's right as hell. I mean, he could not be more right. You just get a salary cap. You get some contracts, and away you go. Or you just keep it like it is. That'd be fine, too. But I got to tell you, the salary cap has to be in play. I mean, if you're going to go professional, go be professional. Here's what else he said. But look at the parallels. You're right. I mean, look at Jaden Daniels, Malik Neighbors. They're all looking for that rookie signing bonus. We're out there recruiting seniors in high school. They're looking for that freshman signing bonus. The transfer portal. He's looking for a free agent bonus. And then the guys on your roster, they want retention bonuses. That's it. That's where you're at. That's where we're at right now. Guy leaves. Guy leaves Indiana State to go to Texas. He ain't going to Texas for nothing. He ain't leaving Indiana State for nothing. So some guy named Ogden can say whatever the hell some guy named Ogden wants to say, but he ain't going there for nothing. Now, my guess is the people at Texas are mad because I gave a big number. And that big number probably offended some of the other guys. I deleted the tweet because my son, who's in coaching, is like, Dad, you got to delete that. But I don't know. I'm always wondering, is this guy Ogden, who's like a general manager in charge of whatever, at University of Texas mad because the number that I put out there made his other players go, what, huh, we got a problem? Or is old Ogden being honest? Is old Ogden being like, hey, that ain't right. Now, I don't know who the hell Chris Ogden is. I don't give a shit who Chris Ogden is. But he didn't go to Texas for nothing. And they ain't mad about me saying that he got paid because everybody gets paid. They're mad because the number's too high. And that drives up the damn cost of others. Who are they crapping? They ain't crapping nobody. They ain't crapping me. <laughs> I get a kick. I get a kick out of the old college coaches now. Chris Ogden of Texas. <laughs> Listen to this text I got. So Chris Ogden is telling me about, wow, Chris Ogden here at Texas. I was calling to chat regarding your recent tweet. Your information 100% wrong. Happy to chat, but didn't want your credibility to write on it. <laughs> oh, man. 
Oh, man, I get a kick out of these fat coaches that think there's something, that sit around. They're just mad because I said a too high number. That's all. <laughs> That's all. Man. So I'll text him back. Don't know who you are, but my credibility is just fine. And we'll see what happens. Some fat-ass general manager in charge of what? The worst coaching staff in America at Texas, which they are. I watched them play. Damn, they ought to be giving money back at that place. Uh, Alan Richardson. Alan Richardson is Reacher. And I got to tell you, Reacher is a really good show. He's not the greatest actor, but he's perfect for that role. He's a big, strong dude, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, the truth of the matter is this show's really good. It's one of those shows where you go, hey, I got to watch the next one. I got to watch the next one. That's how I am with it. Well, Alan Reacher's Reacher came out against the police last week. He said this. He said, hey, police are killing people and getting away with it all the time. What? That's what he said. Police are killing people all the time and getting away with it. Wow. That's interesting. Now, I don't think that's true. Police aren't happy. Police are saying this. While Mr. Alan Richardson gets his face and forehead powdered on set, our officers are out doing a job. This is awesome. He doesn't have the courage to do. While he gets to hear loud pops and have blanks fired at him, our officers feel the heat of the bullets as they pierce their skin. There are no take twos or take threes in real life, Mr. Richardson. We have people who want to kill us, and we play for keeps. Just another useless Hollywood actor. Virtual signaling for attention at the expense of brave police officers around this country. Go back to your pampered life and let the heroes handle that. Wow. That, my friends, is an answer. That, my friends, is something that I go, yeah, that's pretty good. That's really good. Like, if you're going to give a response to a Hollywood guy, that's the response. You couldn't ask for a bigger response. You couldn't. You know what I'm saying? You couldn't. The idea that some Hollywood dude is mad at the cops is funny as hell to me. The idea that some co the cops shoot back is funny as hell to me. And they shot back strong. They shot back tough. They shot back with a freaking personal attack. And I got to tell you, I am here for it. I am. I am here for all of that. I am here for the FOP firing on everybody. The FOP here at Indy, Rick Snyder, is pissed off at what's happening with cops. Pissed off. And I don't blame him. I don't. But the truth of the matter is, I don't think that we should all sit back and take it. I don't think so. That's not what we should do. We should fire back. When somebody is insulting or arrogant and egregious as, Re as Reacher, Richardson, was to the cops, uh-uh. You got to fire back. And the FOP fired back with both barrels. Now, it'll be interesting to see if Richardson comes back at them. It's bad business for Richardson. Richardson should just, I don't apologize. Well, in this case, I'm torn. I wrote down apology question mark. So I'm arguing with myself, which I oftentimes do. But if I'm Richardson, I might say, you know what? Hmm. Interesting. I might have to sit this run out. I might have to just hope this goes away. Or I might have to apologize. I'm not sure the right route. But, you know what? At the end of the day, uh, actors do need to shut the hell up when it comes to the real world. I think we've had enough. Don't you? I watch Reacher. I like it. I'm not telling anybody not to watch Reacher. You might like it. But at the end of the day, you know what? Good for the cops. <laughs>